Movie Planet's bonus show. All of the bloopers, outtakes, and discussions that have nothing to do with the movie of the week, well, we decided let's make a show of that too. Enjoy. Hey, did you see Oppenheimer? <laughs> oh, I saw Oppie. Okay. Now, I have a question because you've posted this several times on Instagram. What is the other movie that Silly and Murphy or Killy and Murphy put together a bomb with golden hued imagery? Uh, Sunshine. I've never seen Sunshine. Sunshine, um, I don't remember what year it came out, but it's uh, Alex Garland and Danny Boyle. Okay. Alex Garland doing the script. So it's got a bunch of high minded ideas uh, using science fiction to explore uh, man's uh, obsessions with God uh, and what links you go to to save humanity. Okay. Okay. I mean, is it good? It's, it's fantastic. Okay. A lot of people have problems with the third act. I will say that. Didn't like how it ended? It turns into, it changes genres. Oh. Going into the third act. Does it turn into typical Danny Boyle? No. Okay. No. I mean, do you want me to tell you? Are you going to? Yeah. Okay. It goes from. I mean, I'm going to see it anyway, but okay. yeah. It goes from a very contemplative science fiction movie. Okay. Uh, and it knows that it's aping aliens or alien. Okay. From the jump, you've got a crew, you've got the the way that they talk back and forth, like overlapping dialogue. Yeah. A lot of the shots see the same. Killian Murphy could have been uh, the captain. He's not the captain in this, but his name is Kappa. Yep. Nope. Uh, and, you know. You sold me on the alien reference, so. Yes. Yeah. To the point where there's an exterior shot, and you know how the uh, there's like water and glitter that come out of the spaceship in Alien? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The same kind of thing, same effect, same looking <laughs> effects. Um, and a lot of the, the, the whole plot is they're going to the sun to drop a nuke into it that Killian Murphy has designed okay. to reignite it. Okay. As the sun is dying. Okay. So you have a lot of beautiful space imagery. Yeah. You've got this crew who's on an important mission uh, and they receive a distress beacon from the previous mission. Okay. That has been missing for seven years. It, oh, is there time travel in this? No. Okay. But uh, in the third act, after you have all of these kind of weighty discussions of what do we do? Do we try to save perhaps six individuals or do we continue on the mission and save humanity? Yeah. Um, it turns into a slasher film. Sold. Yes. <laughs> For me, it is. I'm like, I love this escalation from okay, we've been out here thinking about things. Now we have a dude walking around with a motorized scalpel, like <laughs> slashing people. It's cool as hell. <laughs> people don't believe in heroes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Yes. I am all in. But Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. So Oppenheimer, what did you think of Oppenheimer? I personally loved Oppenheimer, but I could... If you go by Christopher Nolan's oeuvre, I think I'd put it in third or fourth place for me. Okay. I'd put Interstellar ahead of it, which have you seen that yet? I have not seen Interstellar yet. And I know you're going to ruffle your feathers at this one. Dark Knight, I think, is better than this. Okay. But I would also, and this is where I think I'd put it in line with Inception for me. Interesting. Yes. Now, that being said, I know Inception and this are very different movies, um, but it's better than most of Nolan's stuff. I think it is. It definitely feels weightier. It feels more grounded. Uh, I didn't feel like there was an ambiguousness to, to this ending. No. You no. know, the, where most of his stuff is very much like that. And it honestly felt, I felt like I was watching a film and not a motion picture. Yes. Uh, the same way when I was watching Das Boot a few weeks ago. Okay. When I'm like, holy shit, this is, a, this is like a film. Yeah. This is a movie movie. <laughs> it's not like, you know, any other thing that I love. Right. I'm like, this is, thought went into this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, did, what about you, Oppenheimer? What'd you think? Okay. So I'm of the, and maybe you can tell by the review we just did of Bad Boys 2. I'm a Tenet fan. I think Tenet is a, it's a big, dumb action movie that is like, <laughs> yes, it is. it's like, 
it's got some idea, but it comes down to two two guys being bros. <laughs> like that's what the movie hinges on in the end. It's and we'll talk about Barbie next. <laughs> Uh, also, I rate Dunkirk above both of those. Okay. Dunkirk was astonishing to me. Really? Yeah. Uh, of course, I saw it in IMAX. Of course. The only time I've seen it. Um, well, was, you were told to watch it. I mean, it has to be watched on IMAX. Uh, if it's not, then... You're not really seeing the film. You're not seeing the film. <laughs> yeah, it's an art installation. It's not a, a movie. Asshole. <laughs> uh, Fine. You, you chip in the extra three bucks it's going to cost. Yes. Uh, so... I'm also a big, uh, I love prestige, mm. insomnia. For everyone kind of considering me a Nolan hater, I love a lot of his movies. I didn't, yeah, who, must be your other circle of friends. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's basically the Batman movies that I have a problem with. Which could be a tone thing. Could yes. be just the comic, comic book ish of it. Yeah, uh, and I want to revisit them. Yeah. Because some stuff might not bother me as much as it did upon first watch. Who knows? So, uh, an Inception is fairly middling for me. Once again, I've only watched it once, Yeah, but it was after the hype. I had a lot of people like, you got to watch this. It's so smart, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you know, people watching it multiple times to like, get it. Yeah. It's not confusing. It's It's not not a confusing movie. It's very straightforward. Yeah. It's, it's a cool idea. It's a weird idea. That's what I liked was it was, it was a different way of looking at dreams. Yes. Uh, which I dig. But also, if you've watched all the Nightmare on Elm Streets, it's not that weird. No, it's not. <laughs> However, I've always... You've ever seen those um, art, that framed art, where it's like they take one scene, take the, the main color from that scene, and they create bars? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I've always wanted one of Inception to put over my bed. Because mm-hmm. I think it's like the perfect place for it. This is where I dream, and this movie's oh, about Oh, yeah, dreams. that's awesome. That's a great idea. And it's one of those things where it's like, it's on my bucket list of things to put above. Because I do like that kind of art mm-hmm. um, that makes you think. And people go, what is that? I go, oh, it's Inception. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, no, for me, Inception, I, I just love the fact that I love the expression of when you dream, it takes this long. And in the real world, it's only been like minutes. Right. Because it makes sense where you've ever dozed off and the alarm goes off and you like hit snooze and all of a sudden you can have like a, a three day dream in your head and it's yeah. only been eight minutes. Yes. And like that makes total, who's, how come they've never done this before? But you're right. Nightmare did it. Yeah. Nightmare did it. It's just, this was more. Yes. It was more Nolan-y. Yeah. Uh, the other problem with Inception yeah. specifically, which I might now view as a feature rather than a bug after I've heard Nolan talk about it. Okay. Uh, his he appreciates Bond films, and I don't know if you saw the recent thing where he, they were like, "If you're given the chance, would you do it?" And he was like, "Oh hell yeah, yeah." <laughs> well, you and I talked about that the end the end scene. Yes, yeah, that's my problem. Is it turns into a Bond film right at the end of Inception, and they have laid the groundwork for all of this like surreal imagery that could happen. Mm-hmm. You, you got the hallway fight. You got Ariadne turning the city on itself or, or uh, being witness to that yeah, and being told these are things you can never do because it will break the dreamer's brain. Basically yeah. there should have been more pressure to like, I can either save my team or I can sacrifice this guy's brain or I, in order to do that, I have to sacrifice this guy's mind. But you also get the constant worm in there, which is Marion Cotillard's character mm-hmm. who keeps fucking up the works also. Yes. That even when they get everything right, here comes Leo's past. Going to shove him, shove herself in there also. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Oppenheimer. Yeah. It's it for me. I rated it the same as Tenant. Okay. Um, and I might go back to it and it might, for me, Dunkirk is four and a half stars. Okay. Uh, Oppenheimer is four. Tenant is four. I think if, I mean, I haven't watched any of his other films in a decade. Okay. So they're not on Letterboxd currently for me. Yeah. Um, so those three, I'm high. I'm I'm high on the dude. But Oppenheimer is like a real film. It Yeah. And I, here's the thing. I questioned this over the after the weekend was over, which was, did Oppenheimer feel like a real film because it's a real film or because I had just watched Barbie? Okay. Because... Tonally, very different movies. Yeah, it could not be more different. 
And it's almost like, did I get whiplash? Mm-hmm. Or am I seeing it for what it is? I think Barbie might have been a palate cleanser for you to set you on the right path for Oppenheimer. Yeah, it might have been. Yeah. Because I was depressed at the end of Barbie. <laughs> and you have to start that way with Oppenheimer. <laughs> well, unlike most things, you know, in most movies, you're supposed to, the suspension of disbelief tells you that you don't know where the story ends, right? <laughs> right, right. Oppenheimer, you, you know, you know, you know that uh, he, his team yeah, uh, is responsible for a lot of death, a lot of destruction. Uh, and the film in a very six degrees of Kevin Bacon way. Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, the film wrestles with his, you know, culpability yeah. in the whole situation, uh, even though it's taken out of his hands. Right. He does his best to say, oh, this might not be a great idea. Like, well, I did the inventing. Yeah. I did the, the he, they bring it up again and again in the movie. Theory can only take you so far. Yes. Uh, which also comes up in Sunshine. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> another argument. Just have. keep selling me on this, yes. man. I'm in. <laughs> uh, oh, and um, uh, is it uh, Chris Evans? Is uh-huh. it Sunshine as well? Chris Evans is in it? Yeah. How have I never heard of this movie? <laughs> um, Robert Downey Jr. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was brilliant putting him in this role to kind of shed the Tony Stark. Mm-hmm. He's done that brilliantly. I don't think he's done anything since Endgame. This is his first movie after Endgame, I believe. Is it? I think it is. I don't think he's done anything since Endgame. I think he basically retired for a little bit. Uh, he did that documentary. I mean, he's he's part of it. Yeah. About his dad. Uh, uh, oh. <laughs> At least it was released afterwards. Do little. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> There was Doolittle. There was Doolittle. Yes. Uh, But it's funny having him in this movie as someone who you could also point at for being someone to blame Mm -hmm. for the destruction that occurred. Yes. Because he fostered the home that these people could work in. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm looking at Tony Stark's quotes from... Oh, from Iron Man, the I original. Like, I like this through line. Where Christine Everhart, one of the uh, reporters, says, a lot of people, uh, uh, let's see, Tony Stark says, my father helped defeat Nazis. He worked on the Manhattan Project. A lot of people, including your professors at Brown, would call that being a hero. And the reporter says, and a lot of people would also call that war profiteering. And Tony Stark says, tell me, do you plan to report on the millions we've saved by advancing medical technology or kept from starvation with our IntelliCrops? All those breakthroughs, military funding, honey. And when you look at this, Yes, Oppenheimer's work ushered in the nuclear age, and we associate that with the atomic bomb. But what we don't also associate with is clean energy. Yeah. And that's the other side of the coin of it also, is that nuclear energy is the future. Right. And in the end, it's going to be a climate ch- changer. Mm-hmm. Um, so long as you don't have another three-mile three island, but those are few and far between. Um But it's just funny how they chose Robert Downey Jr. based off of his previous character that he had as Tony Stark, who was a war profiteer, to be in this movie that's going to point the finger directly at the establishment. And I like the idea that um, it's shown that these these big ideas, the the big things that happen, are driven by personal... uh, Vendettas. Vendettas, yeah. Yeah, the scene at the end with Einstein and uh, Oppenheimer... Where I know I've heard a lot of people say, we've all been wanting to know what they talked about. I didn't care at the time. No. I didn't care until I saw the scene at the end. Mm -hmm. And they may be like, oh, I had no idea how big a a conversation that was, that moment was. Right. Uh, And I want to watch it again. I just want to give myself a little bit of time because it is a three hour haul. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I loved the, the first third of the movie. Okay. I liked the second third, which was bomb. Mm-hmm. And I more than loved the final third because I knew the first third, two thirds of the story. Right. 
What I did not know was how poorly painted Oppenheimer was because of the government after that. Right. How they sanctioned, 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 and then they blamed right afterwards. Right. Like they needed a scapegoat. That's our guy. Yes. And I'm like, oh, I had no idea about this perspective on the history. Right. And when when Rami Malek's yeah when, yeah, he, yeah, when he finally opens his mouth, when Oscar winner Rami Malek, after two and a half hours, finally opens his mouth and throws Robert under the bus, I was like, yeah, awesome, <laughs> awesome. But I, I heard somebody say this. They're like, look at how many Oscar nominees were in this movie just to show up. Right. <laughs> this, I mean. That was Alden Ehrenreich. I've got the the <laughs> cast list, and it's I'm sure it's not the whole cast list pulled up here. Yeah. Uh, not only do you have your your top line talent, right? Uh, Matt Damon, Robert Downey Jr. Yes. Killian Murphy. Uh, Emily Blunt. Emily Blunt. You've got like that second. You got your Josh Hartnett. Yep. In there, giving a what I think is going to be a career defining performance in that it is going to start the next leg of his career. I also like the fact that Nolan put him in there, uh, being that he was the first choice originally for Batman. Oh, nice. I did not know that. Yeah, and he, and he, and he got passed over for Christian Bale when he found Christian Bale was available. So there was an article in uh, like Movie Maker Magazine years ago. Um, I mean, 2010, 2011, I think. Okay. That talked about Josh Hartnett leaving Hollywood. Yeah. And going, uh, by getting a ranch, basically, and just grow- growing with his family. And if you look at this timeline, his kids are probably grown. Yeah. Or teenagers or whatever at this point. They can, you know, he can step away and do things. And I really hope that this means that we're going to get more Josh Hartnett in the, in the near future. And I really hope this means we'll get more Rick Moranis in the future. Okay. Because Rick did the same thing. Yes, he did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but... Everybody, uh, you've got Tony Goldwyn, you've got Macon Blair, who's like this great character actor who shows up and delivers like three lines. Is she the one that shows up on the base? No, the guy. Um, oh. he, he's in the um, the questioning, the interrogation room, right? Where they bring everybody in, the closed. Okay, okay, I know who you're talking about. saying it's not a hearing. I know who you're uh, talking about, yeah. Stuff. Yeah, he's the guy off to one side. He's a little little jowly at this point. He's yeah. aged a little bit. Um, but he's in there. James Urbaniak, who does voiceover work for a lot of things, and he's very distinctive looking. He's got a mole on his face, and he's got a very kind of nasally voice, Yeah, um, which fits in perfectly with the time period. Jason Clark. Jason Clark, yes. Uh, and is it Michael An- Anagar- Anganario, which... <laughs> He's this kid who he was like a kid in like almost famous. Um, he was in Kevin Smith's Red State. Okay. He was one of the main teens. Oh, I liked Red State. Yeah. He's one of the teens in that movie. Okay. One of the horny teens, right? Um, shows up. So Nolan is pulling talent that in getting performances that you did not know these people could give. Yeah. Uh, Josh Peck from Drake and Josh. Yes. Yep. As the guy whose finger is on the trigger. Who's the uh, the name of the guy who was the, the head elf in Santa Claus? Oh, wow. I do not know. It's it's his best friend. Oppenheimer's best friend in this. Um, Portly fellow now. Oh, well, they all kind of are. Yeah. <laughs> um, who was the best friend in Santa Claus? Or the no, it was the head oh, elf. David Crumholtz. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He shows up, and I'm like, you know, he's one of those actors where when he shows up, I'm like, okay, that's comfort food acting right there. Yeah. I like that guy. Uh, Jack Quaid. Jack, that's right. Uh-huh. Yep. David Dasmalchain, who- Dasmalchain, yeah. Yeah, has had a great couple years with Dune. Suicide Squad. Suicide Squad. Uh, he was in the Batman movies. Yes. His, uh, it's been a while now, but uh, a movie he wrote and directed uh, was out a couple years ago that got kind of a boost because of the last year that he had. I wonder if David Dalsmashian is one of those guys that no one just always has in all his films. Yeah, quite possibly. <laughs> uh, I'm pulling up his IMDb right now. 
Scott Grimes from Crimson Tide and Band of Brothers. Okay. Uh, shows up in here. Gary freaking Oldman. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Uh, how long did it take you before you figured out that was Gary Oldman? Like the whole scene. Really? Pretty much, yeah. It took me halfway around. I was like, is that? No. You're right. And I took out my phone. Sorry. <laughs> and I put it under my shirt. And I looked it up, and damn me, that was Gary Oldman as Truman. Holy shit! Yeah. This guy, has he ever won an Academy Award? Oh, he won for uh, playing uh, Winston Churchill, didn't he? Did he? Got to pull up his filmography. Exactly. It's, it's fantastic. Gary Oldman, another guy that's just like... If he hasn't won an award, he's, he's up for the Tom Cruise Lifetime Achievement Award. Right. He has won one Oscar. Okay. He won for Darkest Hour playing Winston Churchill. Okay. But yeah. Uh, but he's been nominated for Mank. Mm -hmm. He was nominated for Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Going back to Matt uh, Oppenheimer, though. Yeah, yeah. For me, the MVP of that movie is Matt Damon. Because every time Matt Damon comes on the screen, it's almost like this is where we needed a little levity for a second, and Matt Damon's going to give it to us. Okay. Like, I see him, and I I don't think Matt Damon's doing a good acting job. I think he's playing Matt Damon. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad he's there, because if he's not, this movie is really long then. Okay. Like, you need that to help yes. move the dialogue along in a more familiar sense for the audience. Um, Just makes you feel good when you see him on the screen. Plus, we know he's a genius based off of Good Will Hunting. Yeah. <laughs> um... Barbie. Okay. Barbie's under fire. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. Your thoughts on Barbie. And in case everybody doesn't know out there, we are two men. Yeah. <laughs> so, we are allowed to have opinions, too. It's going to be okay. It'll be okay. Take it with a grain of salt. It'll be okay. Take it with your meal like everybody else's opinion, because no one's opinion is better than ours. Josh? Yes. Your thoughts on Barbie? Uh... Your positives. Yes. So message wise, you know, I'm in the camp. I know. Mostly. Uh, I'm in the, the bag mostly for this movie. Fair enough. I do. Okay. So I think a lot of the messaging for me was positive and it was, I get it's a preach to the choir kind of thing by and large. So like the choir so telling people who are going the message they already believe in. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Now. It's it's affirming yeah. uh, what you already believe in and without much challenge to it. No challenge. There, there's not. If that's the audience that's going. Yes. yes. Uh, there was a little bit, and this might just be my male pride, of a little bit too much of the women be like this and men be like this. That's not male pride. Kind of humor. That's happening. <laughs> I do think structure wise, it's got the um, return of the king problem. Okay. <laughs> I'm listening. Where I'm like, this could have ended anywhere in the last 30 minutes. Yeah. There's like six endings that happen. Uh, you didn't need all of them necessarily. Mm -hmm. There's, they wrap up the initial uh, problem really quickly. Of, what was the initial problem? Of, uh, there's the rift in space and time and Barbie, you know, is in the real world. Yes. Starts, okay. Starts yeah. acting weird and goes to the real world. And that's the problem. I was like, okay, they're going to enchant this. Yo, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. works perfect for this. Yeah. Uh, and you get the, at the point where she won't go back in the box. Yeah. Like, but she'll go back to Barbie land under her own terms. Because once she meets up with America Ferreira and, yes. yeah. and her daughter, and she's like, oh, we need to go back to save it or to like set things right or whatever. But did they know something was wrong back then? When, when they were on their way back, they didn't know something was wrong. Only because of the rift, that they needed to repair the rift somehow. I thought they were running back there because the Mattel people were chasing them now. But they're never really a threat because Will Ferrell's character was, repeatedly says... Like, I don't care about profits. I care about little girls' hopes and dreams. 
Right. Yes. So he's not really a threat to the ideals of Barbie land, except for the fact that they want to control it. Right. Yeah. Uh, which I think in another movie would have been super weak. Like you don't have a strong villain yeah. until Ken steps in as your, your bad guy, because uh, not only is he trying to do patriarchy, he's doing it like in a really dumb way. He's doing it in the way that I think feminists view the patriarchy. Yeah. Which isn't real. <laughs> the, uh, when he's in the real world, and he runs into that. It's the, it's the douchiest real world ever on screen. Yes. <laughs> but when he runs into the one guy and the guy is like, uh, after he learns about patriarchy and like that men rule uh, the, the world that they step into. Yeah. Uh, and the guy is like, oh, no, we're, we're fair, fair and equal mm -hmm. here. Like everybody has a chance. And he goes, I thought you were doing patriarchy. He's like, oh, we still are. We just can't say it as loudly. But that's <laughs> I'm a thing. Like, that's a great line. But I think, like, I would have loved to have seen Ken meet up with someone who isn't an absolute douchebag. Yes. Like, there isn't a single redeemable male in this. The, I think. Alan isn't real. <laughs> okay. I was going to say. Alan is an ally. Okay. <laughs> the, well, I mean, he was, uh, he's, he's Ken's buddy. He, he can wear all his clothes. Uh, but he never interacts with Ken ever in this. That's the thing. He, he hates the Kens. Yeah, he's been cast off. He's been cast aside. Uh, the, but the idea that there is no um, real competing ideology for, uh, and a thing that would have made it stronger for me, like message wise, mm -hmm. is if they actually strive for some kind of equality in the end, rather than saying, go back to being subservient. Yes. Okay. You might have a, a vote on the board or whatever it is. Like you can have a lesser position, which is funny because the people behind the messaging were the ones that are the ones that normally complain about the seats on the Supreme court, not being equal. Mm -hmm. And here they're saying, and we'll keep them unequal. Yes. It, well, well it's, it must be nice when you've got the power to do stuff like that. Right. Yeah. It's in, a weird way it's reinforcing the status quo by saying the people in power should stay in power now that being said in barbie land it absolutely should be that way yeah because it's fucking barbie yeah it's a girl's toy they should rule barbie land yes and i personally loved ryan gosling mm -hmm. he is the mvp of that movie mm -hmm. and what's what i found really funny about this is that when you ask people about the barbie movie the first thing they laud is Ken. Mm -hmm. It's not Barbie. No one's talking about Margot Robbie's performance in this. Well, Ken, which is equally good. Yes. It's just she's the straight man. Yes, and she doesn't like her arc. I think really ends, and is it's short, right? And then she's carried through flat. Yeah, because when they come to the real world, and it's the moment that I loved and Greta Gerwig apparently had to fight for is when she sits on the park bench or on the bus bench and sees the old woman and says, you're beautiful. That was a great scene. Yes. And, and she recognizes that in humanity, uh, in aging and getting cellulite and everything and having flat feet, yeah. uh, there can be a beauty. It makes me wonder what the original script looked like because the original script had Amy Schumer as Barbie. Okay. And when Schumer stepped out of it, and said, I don't think so. The From what I understand, and this may not be completely true, but from what I've heard from several sources is that it was going to be that Schumer is a Barbie who doesn't fit in with the Barbies. Okay. Which makes sense because Schumer is not exactly what you'd see as Barbie, if right. you will. And along the way, it's recognized that anybody can be Barbie because Barbie is everybody. You look at all the million jobs Barbie has, yes. Barbie can be anything. She's yeah. never been held down. Right. And in, in that regard, Amy in the end, or Amy Barbie, figures out, I am just as good as the Barbies. And people will play with me no matter what anyway. Got it. And that's kind of, I, I hear that and I go, okay, the very ending of this movie when America Ferreira says, why don't you make an ordinary Barbie? That should have been Amy Schumer's line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you look at where the beginning was and where the ending was, if the idea was Barbie recognizes by the end that anybody can be it, Mm -hmm. You don't need any of the patriarchy stuff in there. Right. It's there as a distraction. And when I watch this, 
I am laughing the whole time. Mm -hmm. But I'm also feel like I'm being beaten with a club. So the moment that this all becomes explicit, yeah, like you have all the stuff with uh, the kins and the horses and all, all of the, they become dumb bros. I love I love Ken's thing with horses. By yeah. The way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the moment that they they pull back and they put it, they put all of that in America Ferrera's mouth. Yeah. And there's that scene, and she's like, "It's hard to be a woman because this and this and this and this." And um, first of all. I don't think you needed to say it. You have shown a lot of that yeah. in the movie. Your character has shown part of that. And also, that's a feminism 101 type thing. And it's also being a person 101 that yes. you have to be able to carry these conflicting ideas uh, of self and service to your community. And I thought it was much more effective the little sequence that comes afterwards when they're rescuing all the Barbies from being brainwashed and they, she has one line to each of them. Right. That makes them understand specifically, which is, it's more pointed and it works better. And I think that her moment in the Weird Barbie's house when she delivers that is supposed to be like this big rousing thing. But even Elizabeth was like, Eh, like I've heard that before. But I also was sitting there going, like, I get the satirical nature of the patriarchy in this. Yes. It took less than a day for Ken's to take over. Yeah. <laughs> what are you saying then? Yeah, yeah. And that's, I, I think Greta Gerwig kept getting her message mixed up in this. Because mm -hmm. I, I th I've heard like four different perspectives on this movie that, oh, it's meant to be satirical or it's supposed to look gender swapped so that everybody can understand what it feels like to be oppressed. And yeah. I feel like people are rationalizing something that, doesn't have a clear idea or it was a clear idea and they had to rework the script to make it work because Greta Gerwig even said that Mattel was like yeah you're not doing this you're not doing this and then there was another paper Margaret was like Margaret Robbie says I'm surprised we got away with this they didn't know that this happened uh-huh and I and you know everybody's equal well except for Midge over there she's not yeah we're gonna downplay her the whole time it was just very it there's t and I've always I've always believed in at least in the last five years that feminism has kind of forked uh -huh. into two directions that we're seeing right now. One of them is um, equality focused, mm -hmm. and one of them is revenge focused. Yeah. Okay. And this falls in line with my idea that when you're trying to fix some kind of oppression in society. You have the elevator theory and you have the pendulum theory. Right. And the pendulum theory doesn't work, but it's the easiest one to do. Mm -hmm. And the pendulum theory dives into the revenge theory. Yes. The elevator theory is the one that result, has the most results, but takes longer to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I heard a friend of mine, she was talking about this, and she mentioned the term TikTok feminism. Uh, okay. And I was like, that's... I've never heard that before. She goes, well, if you go on TikTok and you look at all the stuff there, it's all revenge based. It's yeah. not equality focused. It's, well, let us put you down for a while and see how you like it. Right. And I've always been someone that's, I'm an equality guy. Mm -hmm. I, I want I treat everybody the same way. I, I, I've taken a lot of flack from some of my friends about the fact that, look, you just treat people the same way you want to be treated. You're fine. Right. You know, and well, that's not how the world works. Well, it's how my world works and I'm the one living in my world. Right. Um, but for me, there is a lot of good things in this movie, but I also think that when I hear, like the news out of the weekend was Barbie's getting review bombed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's being review stented also. Right. And I love it when we see things that are being reviewed bombed because everyone is giving their voice now and not just what the audience was. You can't piss off 50% of the population and not expect them to say something. Yes, which, uh as a story, I think it's useful to show the gender swap. We're, we're oppressing, you know. Absolutely. Because it does, in theory, it is the people who are like, that's how it should be. I'm like, well, this is, it's not a metaphor, but it is a taken to the extreme to show you, you know, to put you in someone else's shoes. Right. It's, it is the empathy machine idea of movies. Like, okay, now I understand something that I didn't previously. But it's also the Bill Burr idea of, remember his sketch where he talked about not hitting women? You ever see his Bill Burr sketch where he talks about not hitting women? And he goes, I'm watching something for the 500th time about not hitting women. Who's not getting the message at this point? Right. And it's like, this is the, like, 
the first 15 minutes of this movie, I was on the floor laughing. Mm, okay. Everything that happens in Barbie's world, I was laughing because I was like, this is brilliant. Yes. And when they went to the real world and they portrayed it the way that they did, I went, this is what I was afraid this movie was going to be. Okay. And I had recorded something ahead of time, Josh, before I did my one minute review of this. Yes. I was going to play it beforehand. And I decided not to, because I was like, you know what? People are going to say I'm being prejudgy on all this. And in reality, I've been looking forward to the Barbie movie for like the last six months. Uh, you you wanted the the idea that you called your shot beforehand. I did. And yeah. then I thought, you know what? Bad idea. But when I got home, I looked at what I'd written down beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, damn it, I hate being right. I have them right here. I said, in order for this movie to be a success, mm -hmm. it has to avoid these four things. Okay. If it wants to get its message across. Got it. Number one, the patriarchy must be a problem. Avoid this. Uh -huh. You're not going to get anybody on your side. Men are tired about hearing about the patriarchy. Uh-huh. The number two thing. All males must be inept, power hungry, toxic, or an ally. Okay. They're not allowed to just be regular people. Can't be a dude. Can't be a guy. Number three, women are not allowed to be an obstacle and are only presented as supportive. Hmm. Because something you see in a lot of these movies is that all the women are supportive. Yes. They never stand in each other's way. Right. The real world is not like that. Yes. There's an entire industry based off of mean girls cutting each other down. And the fourth thing, by the end, Barbie learns she is her own woman and cannot be defined by gender, sexual orientation, or any social constructs. I mean... And I went, that was the movie. I mean, more or less, Ken learned that lesson. <laughs> Which... So, that's the other, Why was Ken the main character in this? Well, he is through, like, the second and then the in the third act it's a little more split if ken you, has the better arc yes well, that's what i'm saying barbie once she recognizes that being a human isn't that bad and it's really complex uh, and there's a lot to it and she still wants to do it anyway you could have put her in the the space with uh the, her creator yeah I, at that point her story could have ended yeah <laughs> basically but yeah, it, it, it just felt, it felt like you can take a couple of swings, but when every single time it's a swing, mm -hmm. you don't get to complain about people having a problem with us. And I think, I think that's the thing. I, my problem is that I'm hearing people having a problem with opinions at this point. Yes. And I'm someone that look, have an opinion. It's okay. You know, there were, we, you loved bad boys too. Yes. It has a 15% Rotten Tomatoes rating, <laughs> but you love the movie and God bless you, jo jo Josh. I'm going to listen to your opinion. You know, I, it is what it is, but that's my biggest issue right now is there's a lot of silencing of opinions. Well, you can't say this because you're not a woman. You're not this. Yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. I can say whatever the fuck I want to say. Yes. And if you want to talk about oppression of language, that's what you complain men did to women for so long. Do you think doing it in reverse is going to be the answer? Right. And that's the difference when people and. I've seen it um, with a lot of like military focused things with a yes. lot of political focused things where people assume that uh, any depiction is endorsement, real world endorsement. Yeah. Which, and I haven't seen a lot of like the backlash to the backlash for Barbie specifically. Okay. Uh, but I mean, on my letterbox, it is, there's a lot of uh, very, Three star reviews, a lot of it's fine. Yeah, exactly. Reviews of the people that I've befriended on, on Letterbox. Um, if I was doing a great using the Letterbox format, yeah, I'd probably give it a three or four out of four stars out of five. Yeah, it because it's I don't as much as this movie pisses me off because of the beating I'm getting watching mm -hmm. this. And to be fair, everybody, I am a very sensitive person. Yes, I and I know I don't perhaps, sound perhaps surprisingly so. I don't sound like it but I internalize a lot. Uh -huh. And I'm one of those people that when I'm at work, and I'm sure you've dealt with this before, and one person screws up, there's this mass email that goes out to everybody saying, oh, by the way, please don't do this anymore. Uh -huh. I'm the person saying, 
why am I getting this email? I'm not doing this. Right. And I feel attacked. Yes, yes. And I know there's a lot of women out there who I work with who feel the same way. Yes. So take that into consideration with what I'm saying here. I know I am a sensitive person, but I also know there's a lot more of me out there who put on a different face in public. Oh yeah. And you have to consider the fact that not all males are showing you their personality up front. We have to put on a mask also. There's a lot of performative masculinity uh, in order to fit into society. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, I'm not great with the mask. I'm very feelings forward. You're, you're one of the most genuine human beings I've ever met, Josh. Thank you. You really are. I see you and I get exactly what I'm going to get out of you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, yes, and you I've do. got no problem with that. <laughs> and as my friends get to know me, they start to see those other pieces of me where they yeah. see, oh shit, that fired Joe up. How? He's not like that normally. Right. But, well, because he's sensitive. Yes. <laughs> and that's even, um, I, I've talked to my, my boss at work. One of the first things we bonded over was, um, is my first or second day in yeah. there. And we spent the first part rebuilding the office that I have. Okay. Doodly stuff, right? Like tearing apart computers and servers and everything that was in there. Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, it's kind of nerdy dude stuff, but it's still, we uh, built all these sound panels for the room. Okay. To kind of balance it because it's an editing bay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun. And then we're sitting there, you know, built desks, all this cool shit. Yeah. Uh, and then we're talking about um, uh, Ted Lasso. Oh, great show. And I was like, first and second seasons are great. <laughs> I was like, I was like, do you cry? Does it make you cry? Are you a sensi? And he's like, I'm a sensi. Yes. And I'm like, sweet. Okay. I can. And he said, uh, he showed it to another freelancer that we frequently work with when they're out on job site. Yeah. It was like, cause in the evenings you don't have a lot to do, um, after like six o'clock. So kind of gather in somebody's hotel room and you might watch, watch a show or a movie or something. Right. Uh, and it was just like, a bunch of dudes all <laughs> just, just sniffling <laughs> yes. who locked the doors <laughs> and i'm like you know nate's tearing down a sign and everyone's getting emotional about it yeah uh and i'm like okay i feel like i'm in a, a good place because he's at least i don't know if the other dudes would admit it to me but uh brett you know straight up admitted like yeah you know we have feelings here yeah and that's cool i think my biggest worry now with barbie is that after this weekend and the drop off in the box office is going to happen next weekend because everybody saw it this weekend. Yeah. And demographically speaking, women are not repeat moviegoers. Men are. Okay. You're not going to see the repeated business. Right. I think everybody kind of, as you hate to use the term, blew their load on the first weekend mm -hmm. and if we see a 59, 60% drop in the box office, that billion dollar mark they're talking about is never going to be reached. Ironically, Barbie might not have legs. <laughs> is she a weird Barbie? <laughs> She's a weird Barbie. So Barbie, look, it has its audience. If you're in its audience, go see it. You know, here's the thing. If you're in the audience, you're going to feel celebrated and you're going to feel good. You'll snap at the screen. Mm, mm -hmm. That's right, sister. You'll do that thing. And, and good. Good for you. If you, if everything we've talked about, you're sitting there going, well, I was going to go with my girlfriend. I don't know if I'm feeling it. Go with her anyway. Let her feel good about this. Yes. And just know in the end, she still loves you. You know, she, she, she's not going to be sitting there going, well, I loved it when I walked in, but now I realize I don't need a man. It, right. If she does, then you weren't supposed to be together to begin with, and they'd save you some time and money. <laughs> uh, but if, if you are somehow a male who has never encountered any kind of feminism <laughs> and never thought about <laughs> what the, you know, other 49 to 50% of the people are, go through, Maybe watch it. It might bring a new idea to you. I think if you're someone who's like that, your mind ain't changing anyway. It's uh, the same argument of like when someone comes to your door and asks you if you've heard the good word. Yeah. You're like, 
I'm an American who has lived through, I don't know, at least a couple years, I've heard about Jesus. Hey, yeah, he lives, he lives next door. <laughs> <laughs> My dad does that same joke every time we go to the Mexican restaurant. Yeah. And he's like, I finally found Jesus. Oh, that's Jesus, our waiter. Yeah. I found Jesus. He's in my trunk. 